Um, actually, that space station doesn't have sufficient mass for a spaceship to orbit it at the velocity depicted. Worst episode ever. I, I kid, I kid. Let's go. I'm Gay Fesh, and today we'll be talking Star Trek Prodigy, Season 1, Episode 11, Asylum. But before we get started, make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Before I get into spoilers, yeah, you heard correctly. Season 1, Episode 11. Even though it's been a year since the show premiered. Even though we only had nine episodes before this. It's one of those weird quirks of the animation industry. Because the first episode was double length, it was counted as two episodes on the production slate. If they've split it up in two parts to play separately on Nickelodeon, I have no clue, but calling it two episodes sounds like a legal fiction. But the more concerning issue is that it's still season one. And that's an insidious part of the animation industry. See, if they called it a season two, then all the contracts they have with animators and talent would be renegotiated, likely at a higher rate. But if they just say, we're adding more episodes to this season, well, they can just go ahead and keep chugging along and not paying their employees what they're worth. You'll find this stuff everywhere. For a particularly egregious example, the Beetlejuice cartoon had four seasons. Seasons one through three were eight to 13 episodes apiece. Season four was 65 episodes. Join a union, folks. With that out of the way, let's get into the spoilers. The Protostar crew are following in a long Starfleet tradition of rescuing whales from poachers, trying to rack up enough good boy points that hopefully the Federation will overlook the theft of their starship. Gwyn is still unable to remember the warning that the Diviner gave her because she saw a reflection of Zero's true form. Zero has been devastated by the fact they accidentally harmed Gwyn, and they've spent basically every waking moment trying to take care of her. They've located a Federation relay station at the very edge of Federation territory and paid a visit, dressed in their fancy uniforms. The station is crewed by a lonesome Denobulan who just seems happy to see another face and readily accepts their story and their desire for refugee status in the Federation. He has them all go through a biometric scanner, which gives us some confirmation of several species names. Obviously, we know Jankum Pog is a Tellarite, but when he learns that the Tellarites are a founding member of the Federation, he starts acting like royalty. Rock Talk is a Brickhar, which I think had been confirmed in background information, but I don't think was ever explicitly stated on screen. Murph's species is confirmed as a melanoid slime worm, which is funny because Wesley Crusher was once called that as an insult, but honestly, Murph is so adorable and cuddly that I can't ever think of that as anything but a compliment. Wynn states confidently that the scanner won't recognize her, since the Federation won't make contact with the Val Nakot until the future. Dal seems similarly confident, and the Denobulan even tries to hazard a guess before he goes through, and wants to settle on Talaxian, which, hey, I think I had made a similar guess. He's got the hair and spots for it, but the skin color and the head tail don't match up. But no, the biometric scanner actually does recognize him. It won't state what his species is, but it's apparently of interest to Starfleet because the scanner just says that he should report to Starfleet Command immediately. Ooh, the intrigue. They're granted full access to the station's amenities while they're being processed. Rock Talk, in pursuing becoming the science officer, discovers there are 196 branches of science and starts digging in to learn them all. Jankum and Dal start eating a human delicacy known as hot dogs, and Zero helps Gwen get into a biobed that will hopefully restore her memories. And now we find out what kind of weapon the Protostar has been designed to be, because as soon as the station interfaces with the Protostar's database, a virus corrupts all station systems and it starts to tear itself apart with phaser blasts and malfunctions. Gwen's biobed fills up with water and she nearly drowns before Rock Talk manages to get it open, and the Denobulan blames them for the sabotage and flees in the station's only escape pod. The transporters are down, and the docking bridge has been retracted, so their best hope is to have Hologram Janeway open the cargo doors while they leap across space, a maneuver that Rock Talk has to quickly calculate so they don't miss. They do miss, but only by a hair, and Janeway grabs them with the tractor beam. As they're brought in, Gwyn suddenly remembers everything from the previous episode, especially the Diviner's warning. Meanwhile, in the Alpha Quadrant, the real Admiral Janeway is investigating the disappearance of Takote and the Protostar. We get a nice little holodeck recording flashback of her seeing him off on the Protostar's maiden voyage. She takes her ship to the last known coordinates of the Protowarp signature, which just so happens to be Tars Lamora, the Diviner's prison mine. And who should they find there but the Diviner himself, unconscious, floating in zero gravity? Oh, I bet he'll love to be woken up by Starfleet. So that's it for this week. How'd you like Prodigy's return? Let me know in a comment below. I'm still holding on to a wacky fan theory that the Diviner is actually Chakotay. Be sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell, and share the video with your friends. 
Subscribe to my Patreon to get shouted out in future videos. Check out my Bandcamp for banging tunes, including all the tracks you heard in this video. Follow me on Twitter at GayestFesh, and don't forget to check out my podcast, The Rest of Both Worlds, where I go through Star Trek The Next Generation with a friend who's never seen it. Thank you to all my patrons, with a special shout out to Piftel Cakes and Renee Vorbeck. Your support is greatly appreciated. See you all in the next video.